like I always do. And I have language here like I always do, but I always like to throw in some extra information or explanatory information, which is why it's good to be in the class live versus watching the recording. So um, I've been thinking about uh, pediatric obesity for many, many, many years. And some of my research has been involved with looking at, uh, at uh, variables that might impact that rate and that will come up today. So this first slide, and everybody can see the slide, are we all, I'm gonna make sure you all see me. Somebody, I only see Brianna and Laura and Crystal, so wave at me if you can see everything. You see the, yeah, thanks. I appreciate that, thank you so much. Okay, so notice this picture. So um, this, you look at this picture and probably most of us think a variety of things. And maybe you should tell me, what do you think of when you see this? That might be more interesting than me cooking something up. I think um, I wanna pinch his arms really bad. <laughs> I know, right? That's delicious. Babies have delicious fat on them. <laughs> yeah. What else? Yeah, my first thought was definitely just like, oh, little chunky babies. They're so cute. I love that so much. And I have a 10 month old grandchild now. Got to see him and uh, just recently. And he's just like this. You just want to take little bites out of his arms. They're so cute. And we're never, you never, you don't achieve that level of fat cuteness the rest of your life. The babies are dull. So this is a young person, right? Right. So see, and, and but a couple other things. Anybody else have a thought before I, I get off on this? I, looking at this baby, wouldn't know it's overweight. You wouldn't know. I don't have a lot of experience with kids. I would just think it's normal baby fat. Yeah, I love that comment too, because it's really a good point. You can't tell by looking, in particular at kids, because you know kids are complicated, but also because they go through growth spurts where they grow out and they grow up and they grow out and they grow up. And if you look at a child that's eight years old, it seems to you might seem pudgy or something. It may just be a very well normal, a normal part of their growth. And also parents have trouble looking at kids and figuring out if their child is overweight or obese or has obesity. I'm gonna talk about that language in a minute, but parents have trouble because our frame of reference has changed. You know, I'm old enough to talk about what happened in the, you know, I was born in 1956. So I was a child in the 60s, right? And the world was thinner then. Right, just normally, our, our, our uh, the weight and the weight trajectory of adults went up first, was followed by children. And there's a variety of reasons for this, and some of that I know you've had in classes, but you know we're more sedentary. But the, probably the most most part of it is that our portions in our environment, food types, processed foods, and portions have increased, and it's become our norm to eat a little bit more. And to think of that as normal without really making a conscious decision to do that. And then when we've had uh, more women uh, experiencing obesity during pregnancy, then there's a change in metabolism that actually affects the growth trajectory of the child, not through the fault of the mom, not through the fault of anything, but this is just one of the ramifications of us having more weight on us as a society. So the other thing Another thing I, I think about carefully on, when I look at this slide, you notice there's no face? Okay, of course you do now when I say it. So I'm very much, based on the literature and personal preference, against portraying overweight and obesity in children as a negative thing. We all have, parents have emotions, kids have emotions. And then hold on, health-wise it really matters. But if we're gonna go talk to you parents, and if we're gonna go talk to a community, which many of you will end up doing this in your career, 
if you're going to do this, what you don't want to do is show sensationalist pictures that depict children as in some negative way, you know, and so it's really easy to do that if you're not thinking about it. So let's say you're going to give a talk to the community and you go, go to Google and you know, I'm looking for pictures and, and you find some images and there's so many that are just, you know, there, it's easy to pick pictures of children that are overweight and suffering, obese and suffering, and the health consequences are bad. We don't want to sensationalize it. What we want to do is, is be uh, compassion forward and keep in mind that human beings are faced with lots of um, pressures and parents don't necessarily need to be faced with the concern that they have somehow hurt their child because their child doesn't fit within normal limits here. So it's really complicated because on the one hand, we want to make sure the kids get the best care we can as a, as a health profession. We can help prevent obesity and in, in, in overweight in children. We can do all these things. On the other hand, when we work with parents, we need to make sure that they don't come in feeling like failures. And we want to make sure to the general population that we're not pejorative about our comments and our way we portray children. So I actually show this to talk about that so because it matters. Any comments? Parents from seeing a picture of a child and making a comparison between their child and the picture that you've portrayed, instead of trying to figure out like medically, I guess, whether or not their children, their child is obese or, or is at risk. So tell me, I, I'm not quite, quite sure what you said. Sorry. So when you say that um, you don't want to use um, like images of obese children when you're counseling parents, is it to prevent them from seeing a visual photo and making like mental comparisons between what they're seeing in that photo and their own child? No, actually, I'm glad you asked that. You know, I didn't mean to miscommunicate. Parents actually need to know if their kids are overweight or have or overweight or have obesity. They need to know this because part of us, part of our job as healthcare professionals is to make sure parents understand their kids are at risk. So no, I actually that's not what I meant by this. What I meant is I don't want to sensationalize obesity. And there, this is a nice picture. It's there's nothing wrong with it. You just see some fat here on the kid. But if you do a search, and maybe I should have thrown this in here, but if you guys do a search and you know image search on Google and type in child obesity. You'll find some pictures that are, are pejorative, and what that mean, what I mean by that is negative, and that make people feel bad. So images are okay, but you want to be compassionate and inclusive about it, and not make people feel like you're making fun of a child. You know, it, it's and I'm, I'm not making this up. This comes from reading a whole lot of literature, and there's also an entire organization, the Rudd Center. RUDD Center, I have a link to it in, in your uh, module, about how to appropriately portray uh, overweight individuals in the community so that negativity is not part of the thing. So I think maybe I'm spending too long on this, except I want to frame, I want to frame this entire discussion um, around compassion and also regard for parents. And at the same time, let's not be loosey goosey about it. And let's make sure that we do the best that we can to empower parents and you know, educate the community because overweight and obesity has serious consequences and has serious, seriously can affect people's lives. So it's a dance. So anyway, let, let me get on. So the conversation over the lecture today is about definitions of what do we mean by overweight and obesity? Uh, you know, trends, consequences, causes, and solutions. So let's, get, let's take a look at this stuff. So how do we determine if a child, and notice the age group here because I, I separate this into younger kids and older kids, but how do we determine if a child ages two to 19 is overweight and look at the language or has obesity? Probably five years ago, the language among healthcare professionals wasn't has obesity, but instead was is obese. And so 
there, there's been a, a movement to remove that language because it's more pejorative, and by that I mean more blamey. Okay, pejorative means you blame someone and we're negative. So we use we use this language to uh, be kind. So has obesity. How do we determine though? Because you can look at a kid, and one of you said, "I don't. I saw this baby. I don't know if it's overweight. I just want to like." play with its fat, which is adorable and the best things about him and babies, right? So how do we, how do we tell? So this, this is, gets down to the clinical piece of this. So let's, let's look at it. Okay. So, and, and you guys have had this experience. What one does is we measure the height and weight and remember how careful we have to be, right? Because measurements that are off can make a difference in our calculation, which can make a difference in how we work with families and individuals. So. First, you want to measure height and weight and calculate the BMI. Now, I have a question for you. Have you done this for adults? Like, do you, do you, do you remember BMI's body mass index? Um, do you know we have for adults a cutoff for overweight and we have a cutoff BMI value for obesity? Do you know what those are? 29. Pardon me? For adults, 29. Okay, so for, for which? That's for obesity. Yeah, so it's like 29.99 or whatever. So if, it's, if the BMI is greater than or equal to 30, they have obesity. Do you remember the value for uh, overweight? I believe it's 25 or more. Yeah, between 25 and up to 30. So the body mass index is a, is a number, and we calculate this number based on weight in kilograms divided by height in inches squared. And I know you guys have had this many times, so we come up with a number. So this is important. With adults, we have these numbers, right? So you can go online, calculate your BMI, using a BMI calculator, you can actually do math, and you can find out which your number. And if your number's under 25, what that means is, you do not have, you're not overweight, you don't have obesity. And what that means is probably you're at lower risk for dying or getting uh, uh, chronic diseases like diabetes, hypertension, cardiovascular disease that are often associated with being overweight or obese. And in particular right now, you know, a brand new study came out yesterday, people have been looking at it, that, that being obese increases risk for death and complications from COVID-19. Right, so we have that added element in here now. We've always, always had the metabolic disorders and risk for death, but now those numbers really matter. But the point here is BMI 25 and up to 30, overweight. BMI 30 and greater, obese. Wipe that from your mind because that's true for adults, but for kids, we do the same calculation, but we don't have a cutoff number. Instead, we have growth charts. So let's continue this story. So you have a child, you have their weight in kilograms, height in meters squared, do the math, and then you plot them on a growth chart. And you guys have, I know you've had growth chart experience in, in the, uh, nutritional assessment, you go through this process and say so you're aware of the different types of growth charts. So let's take a look. Okay, so here is a growth chart. Uh, this is for boys. Uh, and it's body mass index for age. Okay, so here's BMI and here's age. So this is older kids. I'm gonna get to younger kids in a minute, but we're starting out with 2019. And so what you see here is BMI curves. And what this is showing you, this, these curves were developed from taking the body mass index of a large portion of kids, you know, in the 60s pretty much, and plotting their body mass index with time. So what happens is, look at here at age two, at age two, Kids, like the first picture I showed, kids can be have some fudge, right? So, so the higher body mass index. Then as they get older, before, this is before the obesity crisis happened with kids, 
that this was what we experienced prior to 1960 or 70. So this is, yeah, maybe up to 1965. This is what growth charts or BMI charts would have looked like. So a child that was on the higher BMI would follow this growth chart line, this, this BMI curve. And so they, the BMI uh, at the age of two might be 19, okay? And then as you can see that it goes down a little bit during these first few years. This is because kids start becoming, typically start becoming more active. So these are healthy curves showing normal body mass index changes normally that happen during life, okay? So this, this would be the kids on the higher end of body mass index, and then there's kids on the lower end, okay? So these are kids that start out with a lower BMI and they end up with lower ones. So you can see how the growth uh, curves look. So this is before we had the obesity crisis, kids track here. There were always some kids that were heavier than others. There were always some kids that were lighter than others. In particular, there were 5% of kids were over the 90th percentile and about 5% of kids were lower than, than the fifth percentile. So this is what we were used to seeing. Now, what happened is we didn't use these charts until to the year 2000. We created them from early data. So, so we had a standard to look at, but around the year 2000, because there was such an increase in body mass index among kids, we, the, the government developed these curves so we could plot where kids are. So for example, some kids thought, let's say they started here at the 85th percentile. They, if they're following normal growth, they might just plot, you know, every, every year they plot right on this thing, you know, up and down a little bit close, okay? Same thing, some kid in the 50th percentile would plot this way. What's happened is we've had an increase in the number of kids that are up over these lines. So what that means is when these charts were first developed, about 5% of kids were over this 95th percentile line. So they might've been here, 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 right? So there's some kids, there have always been kids that have higher BMI. What has happened though, since, 20, since 2000, is more and more kids, not just 5%, were above this line. So when we talk about BMI as a measure of, of having obesity, we're saying, hey, more kids are above your, this line than there used to be. It used to be 5%, now there's close to 15, 20%. So this is showing because if you plot kids now on these charts, more and more of them show up up here. And all of these curves, more and more of them show up here. So we, what we have shown from this is that there's been an increase in incidence of having obesity and being overweight on kids. So I'm gonna give you definitions here, but I'm just letting you know that this is how we plot kids. So you would take the, the, the um, by high age date, real important to get their age right, their height and weight, uh, age, weight, stature, which is height, calculate BMI and then plot them. So if you had a child, um, you're working as a clinician, you have a child and you've been following them for two or three years. So let's say they fell right here, 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 and here. And then around age five, they plotted up here. Then age six, they plotted up here. And age seven, they were still high. This is what's happening to kids. They're not following the growth chart, the BMI curves, instead they're shooting up faster. This means they're developing more adipose tissue faster. We expect this actually, this is called the adiposity rebound where kids are thinner, and they get thin, 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 around six or seven, they get older in the term. I'm gonna show you in a minute this adiposity rebound. So I'm gonna write that down. This increase in body fat, that occurs naturally around the age of six or seven is normal. Getting kids normally get fatter, they have more fat tissue on them around age six and seven. 
Now, so that's called adiposity rebound. Now, with normal. But the problem is some kids don't follow these curves anymore. In fact, some of them go up right here. They, they start moving their body fat up well before age six and seven, and maybe they're plotting up here. Does that make sense? I need some input because I'm talking to a blank slate here. Does it make sense that some kids that are in trouble um, don't follow these growth lines, but in fact, if you're plotting their age and their body mass index, they no longer follow this J-shaped curve. Instead, they may start gaining more fat and thus having a higher BMI. Um, I love it. Um, before you would expect it. Somebody talk. Yes. It makes, it makes sense. Yes, ma'am. Does the increase in um, kids, uh, I guess, uh, BMI, does that affect the growth charts over time? This BMI is how we look at obesity in kids or overweight. You know, we don't like the terms, but BMI is the way to go with this. In most children, if their BMI is higher, they have too much body fat. If they, if they increase their body fat, they increase their BMI, really, most of the time it means they have too much fat for health. So we'll get to the ramifications. So here's a growth chart. Um, and I like this because it's, I swear, um, I'm gonna stop touching this mouse. Okay, so I like this chart here because this is a color coding that shows you how we clinically categorize kids based on their weight. And still we're looking at ages two to 19. So on the left, you see weight category right here. And then here we see the percentile range. So for underweight, underweight kids would plot here. Their BMI would be under the fifth percentile. Is that always a problem? No, some kids are small. I think what we wanna look at though is kids that are in the higher range that get up too high. Okay, so normal, I don't like the word normal, nobody does it anymore, but this is on charts. So between the fifth and the 85th percentile is defined as having normal or healthy weight. For adults, this would be, you know, under 25 BMI, you know, above like 17 and a half. You know, so this would be uh, equivalent to what adults would see. So this is, you know, don't worry about it. This is a don't worry about it category unless it changes. So then the overweight, the overweight uh, category, and this is important, is between the 85th and, and the 95th percentile. So these kids are at risk, okay, uh, for health problems. And then the last category is obese. Well, the second last two, graded obese is greater than or equal to the 95th percentile, and extreme obesity is much higher than that. So sadly. Some of the trends that we have seen have shown kids shooting up past even the, the 95th percentile to, to be way high. So as a clinician, or if you're working in community nutrition, many of you are gonna, are gonna go end up and you're gonna talk to people about things like this. So what I'm trying to do in this lecture is kind of give you some ideas about how to be compassionate, but also factual. So I would not hide these facts from parents, be very clear why we use these categories and why do they matter? Okay, so I'm gonna talk about what happens to kids if they're overweight or have obesity. So this is part of the potential for education. I just want you to see the definitions here. Okay, so now I'm gonna to go to children zero to two years. And if there's a question, I'm gonna stop for a minute and see if you have any questions about the older kids. I'm gonna talk about, uh, show you some graphs in a minute, but. Are you okay with the definition? Do you understand what the definition for overweight is or having obesity is? And those are questions we always ask on the exam, we provide the definitions and so forth. All right, I'm assuming you're good. You can butt in any time. I would be delighted if you did. Um, yeah. Dr. Oh, sorry. I had to step away for a second to 
get my baby out of her room. Um, can you just say one more time what um, the obesity definition for children one, zero to two years is? Yeah, so this is where we get it. So the definition, um, and this is the universal definition in the United States and many other countries, is you, you plot them on the BMI growth chart. So you calculate BMI and you plot them here. And if they plot above the 95th percentile, greater than or equal to the 95th percentile, they have obesity. Okay? Thank you for asking because we always ask you this and it's real important to understand that. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so let's look at kids that are zero to two. Um, so these are young guys. And when, when this, you know, I've been around doing this for a long time, right? So I've been teaching lifespan nutrition for three decades. And you know, I've been following the literature and just so you know, everything I taught 30 years ago has changed radically over the past 30 years and updating every lecture, every semester, looking at current literature, also looking at what's going on in the world has provided a really interesting trajectory of what's going on. Right, so we didn't talk about overweight or obesity 30 years ago with kids because it happened after that. So, but so, and, and when I was first teaching about this, I didn't really understand that babies are getting fatter, but babies, even zero to two years, have an increased risk for overweight, overweight or obesity. And where does this come from? Um, we know that about half of pregnancies in the United States happen among women who are overweight or obese. And it looks like maternal obesity is a, increases the risk factor for the kid to also be overweight or obese. It's not her fault. I'm not trying to just say that. I'm just saying these are correlations to keep in mind. So when we get to talking about preconception and, and, and preg you know, pregnancy nutrition, helping mom achieve a healthful body weight and maintain it's not only for her, but also for the health of the kids too. So now what do you do with little guys? So I didn't used to think they got overweight, but they do. Little babies, you can start to tell where they are in terms of their risk for overweight or having obesity pretty young. So what do you do? You measure them differently because they're lying down, right? So you measure the weight. And typically this is a wrong picture because you would take off the diaper and they'll do that in healthcare settings. And then they also look at re recumbent length. I don't need to do that. Recumbent means uh, lying down. Uh, stature is standing up, but infants that can't stand up yet, you measure them lying down. You smash them out and you measure. I think we showed this earlier. So you get a board, you measure where their head and their foot is and their feet are, and you figure out their, 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 their length. And then you plot this. And don't uh, shy away from this language. You plot them on a sex-specific weight growing growth chart because all kids, the growth charts are separated by gender, okay, or by male and female. So you plot them on the appropriate growth, growth chart. And for this is weight per length because we don't have BMI growth charts under age two. Instead, we have weight per length growth charts. So we plot them on that. Those who fall over the 97.7 percentile are said to have obesity. Remember, we don't use the term you are obese. Instead, we say have obesity. So this is more of a, like having diabetes, instead of saying you're a diabetic, I have diabetes, you have a chronic condition. So kids, we say that they have obesity if they plot that high on that growth curve. And these growth curves, you, yeah, growth charts you can see here's uh, weight and length here. So we talked about this. This is head circumference. Don't worry about that. Growth charts do that too. That's not what we're talking about here. We're looking at weight for length. So you plot the kids and this data comes from World Health Organization, the representative sample of kids across the world. And we plot them here to see how they're doing. They have to see where they fall. If, um, now remember we use a 97, 97.5 percentile, so it's way up here. So kids that fall above this number pretty much are the ones that are, that are considered to have obesity. Um, data from maternal smoking and premature multiple births were not used. So this is kids that are single from birth and so forth. 
So the next section here, so we've talked about definitions with the older kids, we've plot BMI and, and, and uh, we've accessed BNI and plot it, figure out what the cutoffs are. With infants zero to two, we do wait for length, we plot them and then over the 97.5 percentile, we say they have obesity. So those definitions are a little bit different depending on the age of the kid. And I, I always do ask this question because I want you to, to have a feel for how this, these definitions come to play. Because as a healthcare professional, parents may ask you, well, how, how do you know my kids, or is my child overweight or obese, is my child fine? Um, and you need to be able to give them a precise answer. And also in a clinical environment, you need to be very careful about how those measurements occur, right? You want to be careful that you're accurate. You don't want to misrepresent anything. So, so this, this section now is on trends in pediatric obesity. And now that we know, you know what the definitions are, let's see what's been going on and what the big fuss is all about. So this is a table. And I know you may not be excited how old this data is, but I look at this every year. And this is one of the better tables that, that shows the trends in uh, the combination of overweight and obesity. So this is the any kid greater than or equal to the 85th percentile. So we're looking at ages. Um, well, this is looking at uh, for zero to two months. Uh, wait, let, let's let's go from here down. So so to over the age of two. Let's look at here. So how many kids were overweight or obese in? Um, let's do two to five. 1960 through 1970. What's that number? Five percent. Thank you. Okay. Actually, this paper is this is a well-known paper, but they should put a percentile there too, just to be consistent. So this agrees with the growth charts, right? The BMI charts, right? So um, between the ages of two and five, only five percent of kids were uh, classified as uh, overweight or obese. So then, or, or, or obese. And so then you look at trends and we've seen the trending go up. And then you look at 2011, this is, and so forth. And you've seen an increase in obesity in this group, 10, 13, and then it's come down a little bit. So when the percent of kids went down a little bit, people got excited and they're, oh cool, public health is working. However, this hasn't, stayed stable. This has been a, showed us that, that we've got a problem, but it's it's kind of leveled out. So then we look at combined overweight and obesity two to five. What we're seeing, 22%, a little higher, 22%. You may go, well, this is cool. It's not so bad, you know? Uh, uh, not that many kids are overweight or obese, but if you look at the number of kids that were classified as obese in, in 1963, you can see that we've had an increase. So from here to here, for example, we go from 9% to 22%. So we've seen an overall net increase of kids with overweight or obesity in this age group. The rest of this is not so much fun to look at, but it shows the same thing. We're seeing a trend, look at two to 19. We're seeing a trend in increasing kids with overweight or obesity. If you look at more current data, it's about the same, okay? So what we want to do is it'd be a whole lot more fun if weight problems stayed in the range that happened in the 1960s versus what's going on now. So we're looking at a few decades later and what we are faced with is a population of kids with facing more uh, overweight issues. So this is interesting because there's some trends that we see across states. Here's the United States map, as you well know. And what we're looking at is kids are either overweight or obese in the older category, just to take a snapshot, okay? So the lightest states, the, although the uh, incidence of overweight or obesity is still high, higher than we want it to be, Okay, here's the lighter states. Okay, then we have states that are have a little bit, well, you know, a little bit worse, and so on and so on. So we get to the states where the incidence of being overweight or obese for kids is 
unbelievably high, you'll see these states that are dark here. And you've probably seen maps like this in earlier classes. So it looks like these states, it's the um, south, east, south, eastern United States, there is a commonality of these states is poverty. In many cases, it's also a, high, a greater, different percentage of, of uh, 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 Blacks, racial ethnic groups. It, you could map the same thing for poverty, you can map the same thing for physical activity, you can map the same thing for diabetes. These states are at higher risk for being overweight or obese and having those ramifications in other states. So there's a lot of things to look at about this, but just to let you know, and to also let you know that Texas is not so great. So in Texas, um, love it or leave it, but in or change it, but Texas, we don't do very good in terms of protecting the health of our pregnant women, um, our kids, and our population with respect to health care. So we have very few resources for many people. And that would be true of these other states as well. So these are states that don't have many protective um, parachutes for people in our community. So these trends show over and over again. So just kind of give you an idea about it. Another issue to bring up is the prevalence of obesity by sex and race and Hispanic origin. And this is just interesting. So everybody, um, you know, you guys are in a big learning curve uh how to like view the world, you view health, view public health, risk factors. Um, we know that risk factors exist for people that are poor, and that we also know that there's some risk factors uh, based on race and ethnicity and lifestyle choices, lifestyle uh, stresses, there's so many things to take a look at. But this is a snapshot to let you know that let's look at the trends. This is a uh, prevalence of obesity in the United States. This is everyone. So this is probably the most interesting part for you to look at. So this is the, the percent of obesity, non-Hispanic white, non-Hispanic black, non-Hispanic Asian, and Hispanic. So as you can see here, we can break it down by gender, but this is good enough. As you can see here, there are differences based on race and ethnicity in with respect to obesity. And uh, there, are a variety of, there are a variety of factors involved in this. They're always under constant investigation. Part of it's economics, but a sure bit of it is epigenetics and life expect expectancies and so forth. So just to take a look, it's not the same. It's not, the playing field is not the same. Okay, so this is a figure from uh, the Del, Michael and Susan Dell Center for Healthy Living. These guys, this is cited, I mean, this is linked uh, on your modules page. Um, this, uh, these guys put out charts like this that we can actually take a look at, all right? And so um, this is, Texas has the 19th high obesity, highest obesity rate for children, youth ages 10 to 17, and the 10th highest adult obesity rate in the US. So that chart, that graph I just showed you, the picture I just showed you with the Texas having a, a increased rates, this is where this is coming from. Lots of kids in the United States are overweight and obese, and the higher, uh, higher risk occurs among African-American and Hispanic children. And the obesity risk has been getting worse over time. So the, this is such a sad commentary. Um, so let's talk about how we got here and what can we do about it. So one more piece, though, is San Marcos is, in my, as a researcher, very interesting because our numbers are worse than the state. In fact, if you look at one group, racial ethnic group in the United States and in Texas, San Marcos is worse. So um, where this comes from, there's some organizations that look at the height and weight of kids in schools. And they looked at the, the height and weight of kids in San Marcos schools and found instead of 30 something percent of kids having um, uh, obesity or being overweight, over half 
Yes, I've done research and published on this, but what, what is remarkable here is, uh, I call this in my research studies, a pocket of obesity where kids in the San Marcos community for whatever reason, and I've looked into some of them, have an uh, incredible, incredibly higher risk for being overly obese. One of the things I've looked at is their diets. I've looked at diets in child care centers and diets in among kids, which is in WIC. And I have seen that they eat too much protein. So that's something that, that as a research investigator, I have uh, determined they're eating more protein than they need. And they're eating more protein in many cases than I need as an adult. They're eating more protein per day than kids across the nation. Excess protein intake may stimulate excess growth. This may be one of the causative factors for kids in our community having so much overweight and obesity. There's going to be other factors, you know, race, ethnicity, there's going to be um, income, there's going to be all kinds of things, but this is one factor. So um, it's been, yeah, please talk. All right, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Do it. Um, you were saying that they have excess protein intake. Is that more due to like portion sizes or is that due to <clears throat> the push in like protein supplementation now? Like now everything is like protein, protein, protein. Thank you for asking. Okay, so what we wrote in our paper is that um, we don't know because we didn't ask the parents. We, we asked the parents what your kid ate and we did calculations on that. So we did a very well-designed study to figure out what they're eating, 24-hour recalls, did a couple of them, did the analysis. We didn't know, you know, why they did what they did, but when we added it all up, we realized that they we did the, we realized that their protein intake was too high, and uh, so why we looked at what foods are responsible. That's kind of spread across the board. So my, as a researcher, my my thoughts on this come from uh, inexpensive fast food. So and and also from sort of spying on parents um, and looking at their thoughts on Facebook and social media and stuff like that. What we said in the paper is we think that high protein foods or high protein diet has a health halo. And what that means is adults, you know, y'all know the keto diet and, you know, the Atkins diet and paleo diet, all these things say, oh, don't eat carbs, just eat protein. And if you follow those diets, you can lose weight and a lot of people think just eat more protein eat more protein you'll be healthier you know y'all probably know enough to know that that's not the case what we really need to do is eat fewer processed carbs and keep the portion size down and we'll be okay but there is a health halo involved around eating high protein foods so my guess here and you can do that as a researcher after you do the study my my guess here is that parents are stuck going home they're going through the drive through a lot of cases they're getting chicken nuggets they're getting things like that because their kid will eat them they feel like they're doing the right thing because it's high in protein and protein has a health halo and i think it's probably a good idea and it's so this is a perfect example of how education could really help what parents need to know is that the needs of their kids are different than their needs. The needs of the kids involve eating a variety of whole foods and not focusing on protein. So for dinner, you know, a quarter pound of chicken nuggets is way too much protein. Whereas if they can have a couple pieces of whatever protein you want, you know, I don't care what it is. Um, and then some other foods with produce and so forth, their overall protein intake would go down in their Nutrient intake would go up. It's it's like a balance. I'm open to thoughts here. I have a question. Yeah. Um, what were their relative intakes of, of fat and carbohydrates? Um, not different from the national standards. Okay, so they're, they're varied a little bit, but th what was different about this population was the protein intake. And as I said, they, a lot of the kids had, had 65 grams of protein. I mean, uh, I'm trying to, a lot of, I don't have the data from you, but it wasn't unusual for children ages 
three to five to consume 65 grams of protein a day, which is what I need when they needed way less. And in national level, nationally kids eat too much protein. It was in the 40s, 40 grams per day. So we were way up there. And so you look at carbohydrate and fat, that's gonna make up the difference, but does the percentage weren't so different from the national average, it was in fact the protein was so high that it was different. This has been corroborated in the literature. You know, we came across this and we just, you know, banged our head against the wall and went looking. We thought it was a hypothesis, but we looked at it and there's a growing body of literature that shows that kids are getting too much protein. That may be one of the problems with their excess growth. We want kids to grow, but you know, they don't need to grow so fast. They need to have good nutrition so they grow a brain. So they have, you know, hand eye coordination, they move around, they have all the nutrients they need, but they don't need excess doses of protein. I guess I'm just thinking because I'm I'm reflecting on like watching my brother feed my nephew who's six. And my nephew, you know, will have a plate of broccoli, mac and cheese, and chicken nuggets. And of course, he's going to want to eat the mac and cheese and he'll eat some of the broccoli, um, but he won't eat the chicken nuggets. And my brother, you know, says, no, you need to take five bites of those chicken nuggets and stuff. Um, and I don't think, obviously, it's not an ill intention. He wants to try and get his kid to have a well-rounded diet. But I'm just thinking, like, watching my nephew eat, he's always gravitating towards the carbs and he's going to want to grab a granola bar after as a dessert thing. I can see where parents are like, well, my kid's not getting enough protein. Like you're right. Like I understand the health halo and like all the media that we have with the big protein push and, and just trying to do right by your kid. It's just, I don't know. Yeah. Laura, I love your comments because this is what parents go through. The, 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 every parent, you know, you know, Every parent that cares about the health of the kids, and most of them do, have to do this dance, and they don't know what to feed their kids. You know, they, they, you know the information, the education you guys have had is way to date is way more than anybody's ever had. So they don't know about this, right? So what they do know is what they know about good nutrition, and that's some of that gets marketed to them and so forth. So it's very common for parents to pick out something that they want their kids to eat, and it's not always bad. Um, what it, it, you know, but what it comes down to is it's it's that division of responsibility. So the parents decide what to offer, and they make sure the offerings are helpful, and they let the kid decide what and how much, right? And so if you provide the protein, it could be tofu, chicken nuggets. I don't care what protein containing foods should be part of that, but not that just having protein being the primary thing on the plate is where we run into trouble. So like you said, eat broccoli and stuff like that. Well, providing other foods is appropriate. And I think limiting portion sizes on things we don't want to overdo and just say, hey, here's your protein. So I'm, you know, here's your chicken nuggets, here's whatever, you guys. I'm not, I'm an anti-chicken nugget person. I just use this as an example because it's fast food. So in a, in a perfect elite world, you know, here's your salmon or here's this, you know, whatever, whatever. So here's your food. And so the, the variety is, you know, fruits and vegetables, grains, and this stuff. And, you know, uh, not controlling, but also uh, making kids try it and just not providing so much of one nutrient that the kids can fill up on that. It's, it's, it's nuanced, you guys. I've been studying this for many years and it's nuanced. And yet at the same time, what you want to be is um, matter of fact, provide healthy foods. Uh, make sure that kids know they have to try things, not force them to eat bites they don't want, but also not provide too many unhealthy foods. So that would be, you know, worst case in high protein foods, would be mac and cheese and pizza and the things that we know are high in salt, we know are high in calories, we know interfere with good taste preferences. But it's complicated. So what do you tell parents to do? What I say is have healthful foods for dinner steamed broccoli or whatever, most of broccoli is better, blackberries, those are tasty, if salad if kids will eat it, some type of protein, there can be something delicious on there too, but you don't put value on one thing over the other, you go, here's your meal, you decide. And that's the way, right? You decide how much you're gonna eat. 
I provide you the foods, you provide how much you're gonna eat, you decide, and then we're done. But after dinner, you don't bargain for, I want a granola bar and some ice cream. But you can have granola bars and ice cream <laughs> in their world. They just can't be something that's bargaining with after a meal. It's just too complicated. It's not complicated. I think it all comes back to nuances. I mean, there's so many factors at play. I mean, how do you as the adult eat? And then you're trying to also lead by example while still doing what's best for you. And then, like you said, kids requirements are different than adults. Like it's just, yeah, it just seems like there's so many factors I can understand, like in the American lifestyle that we lead, which is so fast paced, how it can feel overwhelming. And at that point, you just want to feed your kid and you go to McDonald's. Man, especially, like this is before the pandemic, but absolutely, especially I think of low-income families where both parents work and low-income, I hate the terminology because oftentimes if people do have, you know, two partners working together, if they're not making, if they're making the minimum wage in our country, they don't really have enough food, enough money to have a household and pay bills and have food. So they're going to be tempted and they're exhausted because they're both working all day. So they're going to be more likely to go through someplace in McDonald's or Taco Bell or whatever just to get something. You pick up kids, they're hungry at the end of the day. It's hard. So I hope you guys understand that I have no feeling of, of, of being uh, judgmental of parents. What I want us to be able to do is provide examples of how they can get around this that still work with their lifestyle right so th this is where having a broad understanding of food food systems what people eat family dynamics what kids need what parents need what they what their barriers and facilitators are to provide providing food we as nutrition professionals and dietitians pull all this together so if you go in and you get, you're lucky enough to be a dietitian that works with a family, at how many questions would you ask? You know, when you think about this stuff, what do you ask? Where do you get your food? Why are you doing this? You know, what are your health issues? You know, so it's complicated and, and uh, but it's very doable and you can change their world. You can change their world, including their health and the health of their kids, but it's nuanced and complicated. I just wanted to make a comment because um, I think uh, another thing that um, is really difficult for parents is to trust that their kids are going to make the right eating choices, I guess. So providing helpful foods and, you know, putting it, putting it in the correct portions on a plate and giving it to your kid and letting them choose what they want to eat is so stressful sometimes because a lot of times they're just not going to want to eat the things that they don't like. And so you have to at times bargain with them. Like, and in my case, um, it's not necessarily that I want my kids to like eat enough protein. It's more, I don't want them to fill up on everything else first. You know how kids like to eat one thing at a time instead of jump around on the plate. So they'll like eat all of one thing and then they'll eat all of another thing and then they won't be hungry for the last thing. You know, it's, I know how you said it's like nuance, but yeah, it's, um, it's counterintuitive, I guess, to let the kid make all the, the eating decisions. I agree. I find it very hard, too. It's just the, the literature, and Ellen Satter's done so much of this work in the literature, is if we calm down, don't try to micromanage, offer healthful foods, and relax, her science shows that over the long haul, kids will eat a more healthful diet and they will become competent in eating. Okay, so that's hard to do, but when you know this as a parent, when you start trying to get a kid to eat something, if they want to fight you, they're going to go, I'm going to eat this stuff, right? So it turns into these battles. So if you have healthful foods and calm down, over the long term, kids eat a, a healthful diet. And you know, if we want them to eat like five chicken nuggets and, or something, unless they want to because eating the one power we have as a child is what we put in our mouth and how much we eat it's almost like the first fight with parents right because you know then it gets into misbehavior and stuff like that but right at first parents have this interest in helping you grow and making sure things are fine it's really cool but 
the, the advice is to take a step back and if they have bad evening days, relax. Stay relaxed. This is, I know how hard this is. Stay relaxed, stay focused on having horrible foods and a pleasant meal time where we sit down and we talk about what happened with your day and we don't sit there and go, you need to have six tablespoons of broccoli, you know, where we just calm down and we role model eating. Studies show that family time together with the helpful foods in the long run ends up with better health outcomes for the kids. But on a day to day, if you said on Saturday, did your kid eat well? No. And if you're paranoid about it, then the next day you're going to go, you have to eat broccoli. You know, and then they're going to go, yeah, I don't think so. It's complicated, right? Yeah, that's actually, you really hit a point about giving kids power over certain things in their lives. That's something I have to constantly remind myself to do is to not, is to give kids their autonomy sometimes. Yeah, that's our goal as parents and it's one of the hardest things there is. You guys, thanks so much for, for the discussion. So let's take a look. I just, this is not on your, your, your uh, PowerPoint. I thought I would take another look just so you could see Trends in adult and childhood obesity, it's all going up. That's all I'm trying to show you here. It, it, it's from, you know, we, the trends have gone up. This is just obesity. So this is adults and kids. Kids have followed the adults. And the thing I want to bring up with this is I think what, how this got started is adults got overweight first and then more overweight pregnancies and obese pregnancies and and there was changes in the physiology that in the, the uterine environment that happened with kid during the development of fetus, right? During development that may have caused a change in their uh, trajectory of growth. And then what that did was they were more at risk for being overweight or obese. And so what we wanna do, we think about these trends is also go back to prior to pregnancy and help women and men who want to start families to help them achieve a healthier uh, body weight. So let's look at consequences. So we've talked a lot about trends and, and so forth, but why do we care? Okay, so I'm sorry, I made this diagram a long time ago. I actually gave a talk on this in uh, San Antonio and I, I liked my image because I didn't want to go race ethnicity, I didn't want to pick gender, I just wanted to pick a and I actually asked the people there, there's a bunch of uh, uh, social workers and so forth, I asked them, was this okay to use this kind of image to talk about the effects on health? And their only comment was, it's uh, everything sad. And I said, yeah, but all the effects of overweight and obesity are hard on families, so I'm not sure that it's a happy thing to talk about. But anyway, this is, and I've also done some research with the community and talked about why do we care about the weight of kids. So I use this diagram in several research studies to work in actually with restaurants in San Marcos, with, with uh, uh, child care centers in San Marcos to go, why do we care? Because if there's no difference, it was, it's not about looks. It is absolutely not about looks. And we need to get away from that. Anything negative for people about their looks, we just need to not do that because it's not important. What happens is when kids develop uh, uh, overweight or, or, or have obesity, then their health changes so much it affects them. Think of COVID-19 right now. A paper came out today that said people that are overweight or obese are more likely to die and suffer consequences from COVID-19. So it's a, it's a sad example. So here's a kid, okay? Your generic pink bubblegum kid, okay? What happens if they're overweight or obese? Well, they, uh, one is, and this is one of the first ones, is they get bullied, okay? So they're more likely to be bullied and, and feel sad. And yeah, it's just real. And then that's gonna affect their emotional functioning, okay? So there's that. And then there's these, so this is a psychological piece. And then there's physical things, okay? So sleep apnea. This comes from, you guys probably know what that means. The sleep apnea is when a person, uh, the throat closes when they're sleeping. Their throat closes when they're trying to breathe in so they, they don't have enough oxygen coming in. So they, they wake up and they gasp for air. So it's interruptions in sleep. 
then they go back to sleep and then they wake up. Some kids or some adults will wake up 30, 40 times at night, not knowing it, but just always being comfortable. I'm like, I don't, I've slept badly, what's going on? It's because, and, and sadly, it has to do with the amount of fat that's pushing on the windpipe, on the trachea. Okay, so an, an increased amount of fat here is, but you know, can affect this. So then if it's sleep apnea, what happens then is you're not ready for a full day. If you're trying to go to school and you slept, you woke up every minute and a half for eight, two or three hours, I'm sure you guys have all had days of, of lack of sleep. So you wake up, see, so you're not, you're not okay. So then you go to school and you're not paying attention and teachers get mad and all this kind of stuff. And these kids aren't playing a full deck. They, they, they are not getting the rest that they need. So then other things, acid reflux, because of the, the weight and the fat, more likely to have regurgitation and acidity and stuff like that. High blood pressure is another issue. So this is the slide where I show the simple language for these conditions. And the next slide I show more the same thing in the more clinical language. Okay, so other risk factors, increase in risk for type two diabetes. You've probably heard this summer, but there have been children as young as the age of four diagnosed with type two diabetes. We used to call, call this the adult onset diabetes, but because of the weight, kids are developing this metabolic disorder when they're fairly past infancy and toddlers, okay? So then fatty liver gallstones, heart disease, um, reproductive problems can, him, can follow them. I'll talk about this when we get to uh, 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 preconception nutrition, bone deformities and so forth. And then the last thing is the increased risk in obesity in adulthood. So if, they're, if they become overweight early on, they're more likely to track into being overweight as an adult. Now here's the language that's more clinical, more professional about the same thing. So what do we ask for the exam? We ask for give me eight categories of problems associated with overweight or obesity in kids and describe them. So these two slides get at that. So this is your clinical language. So cardiovascular, high cholesterol, high hypertension, so high blood pressure, right? Blood glucose, elevated glucose, maybe diabetes. Reproductive, the menstrual period may be off and polycystic ovarian syndrome, which I'm gonna talk about in the next lecture. Psychological, we've already talked about this. Problems with sleeping, talked about that. Skeletal problems, I'm gonna show you in the next slide. And fatty liver disease and also the risk for becoming an obese adult. So the effects on health, if you take a look at these, it helps you realize to the parent, to, when you talk about parents, this is not about the appearance of your child. This is about their life trajectory. And many people have said this, this generation of kids right now is not gonna live as long as their parents. For the first time, every generation up until now, kids live longer than parents. Kids live longer than parents. But right now, these health risks are depressing their longevity. So sadly, they're more likely to die earlier. So there's so many things about being overweight or having obesity that hurt children. So I wanted to focus just a little bit on the fractures. What's going on with the bones? Because this is um, irreversible too. So um, while kids that are overweight or heavier have, have greater bone density, they don't have necessarily the balance because of inactivity, and they also statistically have more fractures. And then if they do have more fractures, healing is a serious problem, okay? You can't, you don't treat them in the same way. A thin child will be treated one way with splints and casts. But with overweight or obese kids, these things don't work because there's problems with the skin. So they are, have surgery. Instead of just setting the leg, they have to have surgery with rods and pins. And so they have to use anesthesia, which increases risk. And then it's difficult to calculate how much anesthesia they need because of the, the body weight's a different composition. So 
And then there's bone deformity. So here's a couple of pictures of this. Um, some kids that are, are heavier throughout their early years have end up having sort of more bowed legs, kind of like rickets, only not exactly where the weight of the, the lower legs was not capable of maintaining the straight, the straight, straight structure. It's called blount disease. And another one doesn't always happen with kids that are overweight or obese, but it's a problem with rapid growth and with kids that are overweight or obese. They have a problem with the ball and socket joint of their hips. Um, the uh, femoral epiphysis, that's this ball joint. What happens is it slips out. So here's a normal one. And here we're seeing, if you look at here, there's a little difference in the sort of lock and key mechanism. And so we have a shift and that, and it can cause crippling pain and also uh, to some extent crippling. So uh, kids run these risks too. But then let's look at how much money does this cost? You know, if you're paying attention to the world at large right now, all we, we fight about is healthcare costs. What about poor people? What do we do? What should minimum wage be? Should we have, should people be able to make a living wage in the United States if they're doing a certain job? If they do, is healthcare a right or is it a privilege, right? If, whether you fall on this thing, uh, this trajectory, people need uh, health care, whether they pay it through insurance or have access to it, or they go into debt and permanent, uh, permanent debt, everything is expensive. And even if you're super healthy and you never do anything, you never become overweight or obese, you exercise every day, you eat a good diet, you can still get cancer. And then you still, you still need to have money to take care of yourself. So this whole thing about the effect of overweight or obesity on the, the, the our entire budget in the United States is not trivial. So children that are overweight or obese cost more and adults cost a lot more. So collectively per child and so forth. So here's the reason because of these conditions that we've talked about, right? So it's expensive. So if you start thinking, well, yeah, man, I don't want to prevent, I don't want to work on all this prevention stuff because it costs money. Well, prevention is a whole lot better than treating disease. Also, kids are affected by their entire life on learning and their earning potential. They don't do as well in school. Sleep apnea is part of the problem, okay? Um, they're more likely to be absent if they're overweight or obese. Um, work in, in adults, people are less productive. And also, this makes me really sad. People are less likely to be hired and also to be paid a fair wage. This, is, this comes from the literature. So uh, effects on earning and learning potential matter. So what happens with the kids when they're five can follow them through. So then we get to the causes. Sorry, I like images a lot. So we're, this next slide, we're gonna look at causes of obesity. And I think we, you know, we all kind of have some feel for this, but it's good to catalog what the causes are. So what we do is we use something called the socio-ecologic model. So I often ask people on a test question to draw this. This is a model that explains what influences body weight, okay? We can use models for different things, but this, this is a model that it shows all the influences that affect body weight. So let's look here. This is a teeter-totter, energy intake. What do you eat? Energy expenditure. How much do you move? This has always been a simplistic way of looking at body weight. You know, people say, well, you've heard it in your intro class, exercise more and eat less. How easy is that, right? It actually works, but it's complicated, right? So, but why do we eat as much as we do? And why do we exercise as much or as little as we do? This has to do with individual factors. Notice these are 
uh, 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 layers of influence here. So individual factors. Um, any of you guys like to be physically active? Yeah? Yes. Makes me happy. I love it. It's part of who I am. Does that make me a superior person? Absolutely not. I just like being active. But that's a personal trait, right? Um, anybody really, my sister's a good example. Anybody <laughs> not really enjoy physical activity? It could be an unpopular question for a nutrition class because we kind of get into this because we're about health. My sister, who's always been thinner than I am, she's nine years older, so she's always been thinner than I'm, some part of body weight. She's never really liked to exercise. It's just not what makes her happy. My idea of being happy is to go out and play pickleball at six o'clock in the morning and then do this and do this. It's just for fun, right? That helps me burn calories. So it helps with the weight maintenance. She doesn't eat that much and not active, so she's, she's a healthy body weight too, but everybody's different here, right? So there's our personal things. Do I like to exercise, do I not? What about my taste preferences? Um, what is my family like? Uh, what about my genetics? You know, my brother and sister don't like cilantro because they got a bad gene, right? So, so there's that individual factors. <laughs> Sad for them because I, I have some cilantro growing in the house right here. And then, uh, Behavioral settings, what about school? What's at school meals? You guys talked about this last time. What foods are kids offered? What, is, what do parents offer? Do they go through the drive-thru or do they give you like this perfect meal at dinner? So your behavioral settings at home and also in, your, in the institutions where we live, college, assuming you actually get to go to campus real soon again, the food on campus is gonna affect, if you eat there, it's gonna affect what you eat. So, and then, and then we get into broader view like, why is why are certain foods so cheap? You can go to McDonald's and get, you know, chicken nuggets, picking on them for I don't know how much because I never go there, but I'm gonna let's just make something up and say a dollar fifty. You know what they're not paying for? They're not paying for how much water was required to grow the the cows or the chickens, okay? And they're not paying for um, so any subsidies or anything like that. And the water involved in that because we don't really make industry pay so much. So they're basically paying for, and, and also, also we don't pay uh, wages, livable wages for people that work in chicken factories, right? And so because of those norms, chicken livers or chicken nuggets are cheap. If we actually paid Workers who take care of the chickens and cart and those kind of stuff, and then and then process them, so they would be more expensive. So these are policy and governmental decisions that affect how much our food costs, right? So if we were think about this, this is the last thing I'll leave you with because I'm yammering a lot. But um, think about this: what if um, chicken nuggets were ten dollars a serving? Would we? I think that McDonald's would go out of business. <laughs> yeah, they would. And so McDonald's has had a really good deal. And part of the reason it's had a good deal is because they have a lot of political influence and they affect what, what uh, industry has to pay for these things. They would go out of business. But so the sectors of influence, parents eat a lot of chicken nuggets or give it to their kids because they're cheap. Why are they cheap? has to do with policy at a governmental level and so forth. So, so I'm leaving you with this because I'm out of time. So I will finish on Thursday talking about the socio-ecological model and then we'll start the preconception nutrition. Uh, thank you very much for your input and for being here today. Thank you.